Hey everybody, welcome to Dad Talk Today. I am your host, Eric Carroll, joined as always by Mr. Chris Gannon. And tonight we have a very special episode that I have been looking forward to for a very, very long time. The world's greatest escape artist, Mr. Dean Gunnerson. Dean, how you doing tonight? Hey, per- pretty good. I'm, I'm happy to be on uh, your, your show with you, uh, Eric and Chris, and it's, it's a great honor to be a uh, a part of this. And before we begin, I just have to say, I, I really, really appreciate uh, what you're doing for Parent Alienation, you guys. And uh, I've learned a lot listening and, and uh, to your podcast and uh, look forward to the day where all this changes for the good. So thank you for having me on. Yes, sir. Dean, tell everybody a little bit about yourself, man, what it was like growing up and how you found yourself becoming an escape artist. <laughs> well, you know, normally that's what I talk about is I, I'm an escape artist. Uh, you know, it's, it's not a normal profession, but, you know, people chain me up and try and kill me for money. You know, I'm, I'm in Texas at the moment. So, you know, I, I, that, that's kind of normal for here, I guess. I don't know the, the great <laughs> stuff. But, but uh, ironically, I was living in Texas when I was 10 years old. My mom bought me a book on Houdini and I was inspired by this man that could do the impossible. There was nothing that he couldn't do. He'd get out of handcuffs. He'd get out of straitjacket. He'd get out of jail cells. He could get chained up and jumped off a bridge into a river and he could escape. And as a young person, that inspired me to, to do the impossible. He traveled around the world. My, my family was just, you know, very middle class. They didn't have a lot of money to, you know, to send me traveling. And, and so as I got into a teenager, this was my way to to uh, to make some money i'd go do do shows and you know i learned a lot of magic back then and and uh, entertain myself and it helped pay my way to the university and then uh you know i decided this is this is what i wanted to continue to do and and uh you know i guess i kind of got good at it and i could escape from the police departments and you know <laughs> hang from buildings and all those kind of things only in the name of good i i, I right. have to say. You know, I've never been in trouble with the, the law, so to speak, but other than, you know, speeding tickets and, and that, but, uh, but it was just a, a fun way. And then uh, as things progress, you know, and, and, and like any career as, as it progresses and develops, uh, you know, I had, I had uh, lots of challenges and obstacles. It was never easy because I was starting a path that didn't exist. It's not like you can go to university and study to become an escape artist. I had to, Learn everything through the, the school of hard knocks, so to speak. So, yeah. what was your what was your first uh, little like when you were when you were younger? Okay, your first attempt at being an escape artist. Like, what did you try? What did you do? Well, I specifically remember again when I was about ten years old. My mom gave me this book, and I remember playing, uh, you know, cowboys, and you know, we had this pink skipping rope, and and I remember my friends tying me up this pink skipping rope to this oak tree uh, here in Texas and, you know, to see if I get out. And it took me a lot longer than it probably would now. I don't know, maybe not. I'm getting older, but, but it took me a long time and I'm, I, I managed to get out of it. And I remember that feeling of satisfaction that I did something that my friends said, oh, you, there's no way you're going to get out. You're not going to get out. And I managed to escape. So that was like my my first escape, and then it kind of progressed. Yeah, I remember in high school when the police came for like career symposium day, and you know, to talk to people about being a police officer and so forth. My friends bugged them and said, "Oh, you know, our friends a Houdini and and that." So they the the police officer gonna lock me up in handcuffs and shut me down and try and get me to become another profession, so to speak. And he, he locked me up and I remember getting out of his police handcuffs and he kind oh of took down. Word. Yeah, that, that was, that was my, my first shot. I've escaped from thousands of police departments and police officers over the years around the world. But you know, that first time, that first moment is always, you know, it's like, wow, I did it. I did it. And, so you uh, were able to get out of handcuffs. I wanted to, or I, I can. You, you well, both. Oh. oh yeah. Yeah. Well, I, yeah, I wanted to see if I could do it because, you know, the, uh, like I said, I, I, I know a lot of magic tricks, but that's not how I make, make my living. But when you right. turn into the realm of escapism, there's no, you know, magic tricks to get you out when a police officer, you know, locks you up in his handcuffs or throws you in a jail cell or, you know, locks you in a, in a straitjacket or something that, that becomes more, uh, 
of a skill, of a, of a technique, of a, of a, you know, uh, physical endurance of, of, of not giving up, you know, it becomes right. a lot of, uh, uh, willpower and, and overcoming your, your fears, claustrophobia, if you're underwater, overcoming your fear of drowning, uh, you know, if you're hanging by your toes from a trapeze over, you know, Hoover Dam, uh, you know, these are all these fears that you have to overcome in these difficult situations. So, Dean, I want to talk to you a little bit about Houdini. Again, I have been looking forward to this. I have studied Houdini, the amazing Randy, who I know was a mentor of yours. It kind of passed the torch over. A lot of people know Houdini for his magic. He'll probably go down in history, I would say, as the, the greatest magician that ever lived. What a lot of people don't know, Houdini spent the later years in his life debunking psychics and other people that claim to have powers that they didn't actually have. Uh, could you tell a little bit about the importance of what he did in his later years, Dean? Yeah, and you're exactly right. Uh, back then, around the turn of the, the after the First World War, uh, a lot of mothers lost their, their sons, sadly and tragically, in, in the war. So an industry kind of grew out of opportunism, and uh, all these mediums and psychics popped up. So mothers could pay some money, they could go see the medium, they'd have a seance, and their dear son would talk to them and say, you know, everything is okay in the afterlife and give him some type of message and this and so forth. And so Houdini had lost his mother around the same time, and he, he, he deeply miss, missed her. And so he would go see these mediums as well. And what he found out is that they were doing magic tricks. Uh, they would make objects float that were supposedly by ghosts, chairs, tables, bells ringing, um, all these things that they said were communication from, from the dead, from beyond. And so Houdini got really upset with this because they said that they were delivering uh, true communication, but in, in, in false pretenses, they were actually doing magic tricks. And it's one thing if you say, okay, I'm doing a card trick and, you know, it takes a lot of skill and technique or saying, you know, I can, you know, really physically, you know, penetrate this and, and do this. And so Houdini spent the last part of his years, like you said, exposing them and they hated him for this. And he went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United oh, States wow. and spoke in the Senate about trying to put in laws uh, to ban uh, mediums. Wow, that's awesome. And you know, this all started, guys. The reason that Houdini was doing this, he was very close to his mother, and his mother had passed away, and he had gave her a code word that if she could actually contact him uh, after she passed away, that that psychic would do it. And he caught somebody in the middle of it, and that's when he started dedicating his life. He said, "You know what? This is fake." I, I, I want to make sure that you never do this to anybody else. And that's what I'm going to dedicate the rest of my life to much like what we're doing here at the podcast with title 4d parental alienation and, and ch the child abuse that it is. We're trying to uncover it for what it really is. And Dean, you are not, it's not a privilege by any means, but you know what it's like to experience parental alienation. Would you say that there's definitely a correlation between the two? Yeah, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, Eric. And, you know, I, I've spent, uh, I, you know, R Randy, the amazing Randy is, is the real modern day uh, Houdini investigator and a psychic phenomenon, investigate a lot of stuff. Uh, and I've always been really close with Randy. Um, and I, I kind of did some of the same investigation into, into things uh, when it was presented to me. And so, again, you... you Nobody likes to be conned. Nobody likes to be cheated. Uh, and so when you see that happen, you, you know, you like to step in and say, no, it's not really the way it looks. This is the truth, right? I mean, that, that's what we all need. We need to be truthful. We need to be honest. It's one thing if it's done for entertainment, but it's another if it's done under false pretenses. And, and Randy was really well known for that. And as a parent, I, I have two you know, beautiful young girls. They're 10 and 12. Uh, I've been separated and divorced for about five years. And, uh, you know, I've tried to be a very loving and caring family or parent uh, and my, my whole family. And as things kind of grew and changed, uh, you know, I noticed things starting to change and, 
in, in anger with, with the girls and, and starting to pull back and, and from me and my family and stuff. And it's like, you know, at first I thought it was the girls. It's like, well, what's wrong with you? I'm trying to seek help and therapists and stuff like and deal with these anger issues. And it wasn't until last year where I actually came up with, realized that it, it was parent alienation and what things were being said and done uh, and untruths being said and manipulation, much like these mediums and psychics uh, do to convince you that something is different than it actually is. And so all of a sudden, I, I, in the last few months, I've had to use my, my resources as an as a investigator and understand parent alienation and, and the tricks and techniques that an alienating parent will do to deceive judges, courts, lawyers, uh, therapists, teachers, and so forth. And it, it, it's a lot harder to, to, to prove um, than it is somebody that's, that's bending a spoon supposedly by their mind as Yuri Geller used to do because it's, yeah. it's very layered and, and it's, it, it happens over time. It, it, it's quite the con. There's two things that comes to mind when we're, when we're talking about this, Dean. I'm, I've just got to be honest with you. I've been watching your videos and everything. Again, the whole thing intrigues me. So this is such an honor to have you on and thank you again. But with your profession, the, the magic tricks and the escape tricks that you're doing, you're, you're tying yourself up on roller coasters, getting off of it before they, they hit you. You're Most hanging, of the time. <laughs> yeah. You're hanging almost 800 feet up above Hoover Dam and stuff like that. That's the kind of things that would just make kids want to flock to you. I'm so proud of my dad. Guess what my dad does? And then I was watching you. Here you are, again, almost 800 feet above Hoover Dam, hanging on by your feet. There's nothing holding you in getting out of a straight jacket. And we talked about this a little bit the other day when I was talking to Chris, I was like, what skill and patience this man must have to be able to hang there like that and to take that off. That takes extreme patience and, and concentration. Mm -hmm. And I was like, for him to be going through parental alienation and fighting this battle, there must be something that really, you know, is going on bad. Like, are, have you, learned a little bit about gaslighting and the importance of like when somebody says something just to get you to react and how just to kind of step back and be like, I'm not participating in it. Yeah. You know what? You, again, you're, you're, you're right, Eric. And at first I would get upset and angry and try, I didn't understand why, why certain things were happening with my daughters and my ex. And then as you understand it, you do have to have a great deal of, of present patience and you know whenever I, I see my daughters my daughters haven't spoke to me in over two years but when I do see them you know you got to talk to them and, and realize that that isn't coming from them it's coming from you know their their mother and so it does and I think that's one of the the most important things that any parent uh, or family member that's being alienated is is to have patience and it's not easy I, as as you and Chris both know, it's not easy to show patience in this uh, this world of alienation when everything is just coming down on you and suffocating you. And you know, I, I, I've been buried alive uh, a few times for a day at a time or two days at a time with no food and water and a coffin, and, and it just feels suffocating. And you know, and then having to escape. But again, that's nothing, nothing to to the to the the pain and, and struggles of, of, of dealing with, with, with what's going on. So, yeah. you know, my heart goes out to, to all the, 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 the parents out there that are, that are suffering from this because I, I, I know it firsthand and mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I want it to stop like you guys. Much like you, we've had a guest on this show. He was a former son-in-law of Muhammad Ali, two-time world champion boxer. Uh, uh. And he wow. said he's been in street fights his whole life. He, he's been with the best of them in the ring. And to this day, the worst fight he's ever been in is parental alienation. Yeah, I, and I, I totally understand that. And Dean, yeah. with, with what you're doing, you're, you're putting your life on the line each time you do a trick like this. And the first question that comes to mind to me is, I know how parental alienation, not being able to see my kids, affects me on a daily basis, Okay. When you're doing your, your, your tricks and your, your stunts, 
Um, how do you separate that in your head? Because I imagine like before the alienation was occurring, you probably had a lot of clear perspective where you, you know, knew what you needed to do. Uh, but afterwards, it kind of changes your mindset because we know being alienated from your children is always like a little storm cloud that follows you around. How did you deal with that? Because you don't have room for air, no room for air with what you do. Yeah, you're 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 right. When you when you're doing some of these big escapes, like getting chained to a roller coaster or chained to a bomb, hanging in front of your ankles from a crane and a burning rope, uh, you, you know you you don't have have room. And uh, I, I had a TV series called Escape or Die, where every episode we'd travel around the world, and you know get locked in a metal coffin, thrown in the ocean, the Bahamas with sharks, or locked into a, a plexiglass snake pit in Malaysia with you know, a couple dozen pit vipers crawling all over me and escaping from handcuffs and, and things. And I, while my TV show was going on, I was dealing with this, you know, firsthand and, you know, the, my separation, my divorce and, and, and dealing with all the, the crews, the escapes, the, the life. And that storm cloud is there. You can't get rid of it. You can't that the, the thoughts of your your children, your you're being alienated, you, you know, you're you're being pushed away is always there. And it becomes real hard to try and keep that focus. I, I always say when I'm doing my escapes, I everything gets blocked out. Your 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 uh, your window really gets small. You, you're like a horse with blinders on. You know, you have to focus exactly what you're doing because one little slip and, and you can die. And, you know, I've hurt myself many, many times over the years. And I used to joke that one of my, my heroes growing up was Evil Knievel. And I, uh, I never wanted to break his record for most broken bones in a body, but, but it's getting pretty close. But, you know, every time I've, I, since, since I, I've been divorced, I always keep two pictures of my daughters. I take them, I put them in my pocket, I kiss them. And, you know, they're my angels. They're the reasons I make sure I get out, that I, I, I make it through an escape, that I, I try and get through without getting hurt or busted up or, you know, live to come home to, to, to see them again. And, they, you know, they're, they're the ones that I, that I fight for. They don't know that I'm fighting for them right now. They, the children don't even know that parent alienation is going on, right? They, they don't understand what, what's happening because they've been so brainwashed and so uh, influenced by, by this, by, by another adult. So, you know, hopefully someday they'll, they'll understand this when they become adults and go through it. But, you know, the, the hard part for me is when you get, uh, evaluators or lawyers and they say, just, you know, walk away, leave it, you know, let them be, they'll come back to you someday. And it's like, well, how do you let that go? I mean, these are children. You have to protect the children, you can't let them just drown, right? If they were in a in the river and you know they, they can't swim the shore and they're drowning, you wouldn't just walk away and say, well, you know, don't worry, sooner or later you'll get the shore. You know, you have to throw them a life preserve. You can't let them go. And so, like the, these thoughts are always in your head, and you have to be careful, or I have to be careful when I'm in these situations or performing. You know that that it's there and and and. You know, it, it, it is. It, it, it's hard. It's really hard. It can, you know, become a struggle. It can become depressing. It, 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 it's sad. Like I said, mo most people don't understand, so you don't even talk about it. I mean, you know, it helps to have a, a good supporting partner that that believes and understands in this. But, you know, it's, it's, it's not an easy task. I, and for me as an escape artist, and I've done impossible situations, I've done things that nobody else in the world has ever done this becomes overwhelming at, at times and a difficult pass. And, 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 you know, I, I hope I can escape through it someday, you know, just, just to save my daughters, you know, that's I don't this, do it for me. I do it for them. You know, that's the surprising thing. These amazing things that you're doing, that would be like, again, that's a magnet for any kid. Look what my dad is doing. So yeah. it kind of, you know, makes you wonder, you know, what just has went on and much to the surprise of a lot of people, Dean, uh, most of the professionals that are studying parental alienation, they got into this because they were going through it. Just about every single one of them, or wow. maybe their spouse or somebody, but somehow they are connected to it. And most of us alienated parents 
didn't even know what parental alienation was until we were going through it. And that's what you're seeing with a lot of these people. Okay. They think, Oh, that's never going to happen to me. So I don't have to worry about it. That was every single one of us. And then when we found ourselves in it, we're taken to Google, we're taken to YouTube. We're trying to find out what's going on with me because nothing makes sense. Now, is that kind of similar to what happened to you? Did you know what you were getting into when it was happening or did you were like just sitting there in the blinders? Like what's going on with me? Yeah. Well, that's just it. You're, you're again, you're, you're right. You don't understand it as it's starting to happen. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like being conned, right? You don't know you're being conned till after your money's gone and you walk away. Like, what just happened here? And that's kind of what happened with, with, with my daughter. I didn't realize it was being happening. And, and, you know, one thing that I really like what you're doing and bringing attention to it, because I didn't even know the term parent alienation till last April. And I was having a coffee with a friend of mine and knew my situation. He said, you know what? I saw something on the news last night. And he said, it sounded just like, you know, what you're going through. So I went back home, went on the internet, found this news broadcast, and they talked about the term parental alienation. And I, the light clicked on. I was like, oh my goodness. And then I started researching and reading. And I was like, this is so clear. Why, why don't the judges and and the lawyers and the evaluators and the therapist, why don't they understand this? Why don't they know it? And it's like, you know, I have to pay my lawyer to educate them about parental alienation. They should be the ones educating me or educating the other parents that are going through this. Uh, so, so I think that's the real key for this is that, you know, what you're doing and what, what I think needs to happen with the whole uh, movement is that we need to educate other parents that this going through, but more importantly, the general public. So we don't have to have this badge of shame and put our heads down that, you know, we're being alienated. It's, it's not something we did. It's like mental illness, right? Mental right. illness has kind of uh, gained a lot of power in the last, last few years. And, 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 you know, you don't have to have your head down because you're dealing with a mental illness, like anxiety, depression, you know, it, 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 it's an illness. That's exactly what it is. And I, I think a lot of times we see ourselves wanting to hate the other side for doing this to us. Mm -hmm. But when you really allow yourself to heal and study what's going on, a lot of them do not really understand what they're doing. You know, it's we're, we're dealing with mental illness. And if we could show the courts that we're not saying we hate this other person, we want to take them out of the kids' lives, any of that. We're saying this is a real problem. Let's get them help and let's get the parents back into their kids' lives. That is the the heart of the matter right here. And where a lot of people come short, Dean, and we talk about this a lot, is they try to prove parental alienation in court. And that's where they go and get all these different uh the, uh, doctors and, and psychologists in there trying to prove this is parental alienation. This is parental alienation. We've got to cut that out. We've got to look at the courts and say, this is child abuse. That's what it is. Exactly. We're going to prove that this is child abuse. And when somebody's being brainwashed or to hate that other parent and they don't want that relationship, you can see it for a mile away. Let's deal with it. And that person that's doing it, they need help. They yeah. need help. Let's find them help. And for any of the alienators out there or anybody that's being alienated, I'm telling you that that's the approach that I think we need to do because I don't think they can help it. I really don't. It is a, a mental illness and don't allow yourself to hate them no matter how hard it is. But again, the importance, you know what? There's going to be much gaslighting, man. They, they're going to alienate you and then they're going to tell you it's your fault. It's your fault. It's your fault. And they're just going to keep poking you. Don't engage. Yeah. Do not engage. <laughs> And that's part of the, the, the step of going through this. I mean, it, it's like a 12 step program, right? You it understand what, what's going through it. And, and I did, I did hate my, my ex for a while because like, how could you do this? And I asked her, why do you hate me more than you love your children? How can you put this through? And of course, as an alienator, there, there's a lot of narcissism that's in there and a lot of delusion because they don't realize, you know, sometimes of what they're doing. I think sometimes they, you know, they, they know what they're doing, but maybe not the full effects of it, right? They don't understand the long-term consequences because it is, it's child abuse. I've, I've gone to child family services in Canada and say, look, you know, my ex is mentally abusing, you know, my children. And they go, oh, we don't do with that. As if there was physical abuse, they're right there. Yeah. But if it's a mental abuse, that's okay. How can that be okay 
to mentally abuse somebody cause the long-term effects that parent alienation causes and that can be okay. That's what I want to I want to see. I want to see that change so children don't have to suffer. They don't have to pay, you know, long-term uh, therapy costs and psychiatrist costs to to recover from that someday because we know what the long-term effects are of parent alienation. And I can tell you why every single bit of that is happening without even having to tell you a word. I can do it with my hand right here. They're yeah. getting paid. It makes too of much money. money. We are selling our souls money. and breaking the relationships of kids with their parents over a dollar bill. And it's sad. And we're increasing a dysfunctional society doing it. Yeah, absolutely. And Dean, you mentioned, you said you have two daughters that you're alienated from, correct? Yes. Okay. Do they, do they know what you do for a living or are they too oh, young yeah. to... Uh, they yeah, do you know yeah i, I mean I, again i i'm a late bloomer as a father you know i've i traveled the world when i was you know younger and performer and uh, performing and you know so i didn't have my daughters till i was in my my early to mid 40s uh because then i, I you know i kind of was slowing down a little bit and and i decided you know i i needed i wanted to have a family and you know what my wife would talk about it and it's like yeah let's have children. So, you know, I still would travel, but not as much to the extent that I was before. So yeah, my, my daughters grew up <laughs> with, with handcuffs and straight jackets. And I, ha I have a big shop in my, I, I live in the country. I, I have a, a beautiful piece of property. I, I call it an enchanted forest and I have a big shop there. So in my shop, I call it the morgue. It's coffins from, you know, being, you know, buried alive or, are, are oh, wow. all my contraptions in there and, and my, my Houdini collection, my Doug Henning collection, my Amazing Randy collection, you know, milk cans. And, you know, I probably have about six or 700 sets of handcuffs alone. Uh, you know, so my props were in there. We, we would film, uh, you know, my TV show there. So it was right in their yard. So, you know, it, my daughters were on every single episode of my TV show. Oh, wow. Some shows I had them physically on there. Or I always had their, their pictures with me in, in my heart, in my pocket, close to my heart. And they've come to my shows. Not everything I do is death defying and life threatening. Right. I, you know, I do a lot of corporate shows. I do a lot of uh, motivational talking and talk about achieving the impossible in your everyday life. You know, the power of visualization. Um, you know, when, when I was young, I, I had uh, leukemia and went through uh, three years wow. of chemotherapy and radiation. and. And so I, I do a lot for the uh, the cancer society and 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 try and give some inspiration and, and hope to, to people that are there. And you know I've I've survived cancer for over forty years. Uh, so and that that's back when when things were really bad. Right. Um, and, and so trying to deliver a positive message. And those are all messages that I want my daughters uh, to know. I want them to be strong, independent. Uh, you know, young women and old women so that they don't need me. I don't want them to have to need anybody. I want them to be, be strong and powerful and, and to achieve anything they want in life. And when you're dealing with an alienator that takes that away um, and, and wants, you know, weak, uh, needy lives within a messed uh, parent, uh, it, it, it's really hard to see. It's, it's, it, 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 it's sad. Right. Wow. So, Dean, would I be correct in saying, sorry, you, you, you've escaped uh, Hoover Dam, you've escaped these graves. Now, the only thing you haven't learned how to escape is parental alienation. I'm just a little curious. Would you say with your line of work that you were on the road a lot? Um, well, yeah, that's one of the things that, that the evaluators uh, tried to say, oh, I was on the road all the time. And so that's why the children are closer to their mother. And I mean, that's not true. I mean, I'm, I'm away for little short periods of time and then I come back and then I have extra time to spend with them. And, you know, my, my wife had two children with her first marriage and my wife was a stay at home mom. And that, that was fine. That was great. You know, I wanted to give as much love and attention to my children as possible. So, I mean, you know, I had six mouths to feed. I mean, you gotta, you gotta keep working. You gotta make a, make a living, but you know, lots of people have to travel and work. I mean, there's men right. in the, and women in the military that go away for six months at a time and come back and, and still have strong relationships with their, 
with their parents. Uh, you know, people have to travel in, in, in different trades and businesses to, to go on way and work. And, and that's just, you know, part of society. It's, it, it may be not perfect, but I mean, it's, it's always been there. I, when I was young, my father was in the construction business. He had to go where the work was, you know, he'd have to drive and, and go away and work, but I still have a strong positive relationship uh, with my father today. Right. And that's kind of where I was going to that. And in the, the next part, I was figuring, I, I know that had to be used against you somehow. Was that mm-hmm. something I know you said that you, the, uh, the lawyers did, but was that used against you? Did, did that play itself into the alienation with you being gone? What did that leave like open cracks to like, oh, I'm going to use his absence against him. Yeah, that, that's exactly one of the things that, that they use. And it's like, well, you know, it's funny. It's something, you know, I, I knew my my wife for a long time before we actually started dating or getting married. You know, for almost 20 years, we were friends. Uh, so she knew exactly what I did and what I and, and at that time it was great. Right. You know, you have children. It, it's great. And whenever I travel, I always bring things back from my children. You know, I've, I've done over 500 shows in China over the years. You know, I've traveled all through Asia, India, Europe, South America. So I'd come back and, and, and share these experiences uh, with my children and bring them things back. And hoping that someday, not as a performer, but, you know, that they would get to experience this. Because, you know, that's, I think, what... Uh, one of the greatest things for me as a performer is that I've been able to see so many different people and been able to entertain them, to make them laugh, to, to have empathy for, for different cultures and different people, different colors of skin, uh, different circumstances, poor, rich. You know, my, my spectrum of friends goes all over. And these are things that I wanted to teach my daughters and not being able to do so. Uh, so I tried to use all that as, as positive uh, learning experiences for them. Dean, where are you at? Where are you at in your journey now? Are you still in litigation? Or are you kind of where I'm at, where you have to take a step back and say, well, hey, my kids are older. They're going to be aging out of this system uh, within the next you know, six or seven years, and they're going to be old enough to make their own decisions. Where, where are you at in it right now? Well, again, because my daughters are still relatively young, 10 and 12, um, I, I have not a single agreement in five years of that I have any type of custody, nothing. She won't sign anything or whatever. So I'm at the whim of my, my ex of, of when I get to see them. So right now is it's, it's custody. So I'm officially divorced, divided up the assets. Like I said, you got to go through everything titled to 50, 50, no matter, like I said, my, my ex didn't work. That's fine, but I'm still entitled to 50, 50. But like I said, for the, for the children, I'm still fighting for, you know, like a small percentage. So I went through a period of time where I wasn't allowed to see them at all. And so uh, through the therapist that I was paying to send my, my children, uh, she recommended that I, I see them for, for Friday nights uh, for like two hours. Well, I've, for the last year, I've picked up my, my children on, on every Friday night that I, I could, but they don't talk to me. Uh, they won't look at me. They won't look at the grandparents. They won't see any of anybody from the family. They keep their faces covered. Uh, they've been totally alienated. So we drive around. I, I live in the country. I, I live in a beautiful spot next to a national park. Uh, we go look for bears. We go for ice cream. They won't get out of the vehicle. But I just talk to them in positive ways. I try and put uh, positive messages, loving messages, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing and so that they go home. But again, you put those positive messages, they go right back to the alienator and it erases everything, right? Like, like you know, it's like living in a cult, you know, they need to be extradited from that situation and, and kept away for a little bit so they can be, you know, de- deprogrammed. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the sad part about it. We don't know what's being fed to the children to make them that way. You know, one of the reasons I was asking you about, you know, when you was off for work, if that became a way to kind of go at you, you know, I don't talk about my personal case much. I'll just give you a little glimpse of something about a year and a half ago. I had knee surgery. I was in a wheelchair for almost two months. I didn't go anywhere for a month. And that was used as a, uh, see, he hasn't even came and seen his kid in a, in a month. 
Okay. He hasn't even came and seen. He's a deadbeat. I hadn't went anywhere. I couldn't. And they knew that, but that they'll take any little opportunity they can to paint that picture. And what's going on right now is Dean, I don't know if this is your case or not, but I'm saying anything they can use against you to make you that deadbeat, to make you look like you don't care. You don't want to be there. Any little thing will be used against you. And it's little subtle undertones that over time makes that child just completely brainwashed against their parent. And that is abuse. That is abuse at is. The, the highest level of abuse to make a child not want that relationship with their parent. And I hate to hear that you're going through this, man. You travel the world putting smiles on little kids and, and big people's faces, you know, all the time. And I'm sure those are two, you know, little children that more than anything, you'd like to put a smile on their face as well. And you're not getting the opportunity. I, I sure hate yeah. to hear that. My yeah. yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you got two points and they, they will, and they, 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 they find it, you can't do anything right because if you do something good, they change on that. If you do something bad, they, 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 they work on that as well. So you can't do anything good you know if if you call and and they don't answer the phone every night it's like well you're bugging them you're harassing them if you don't call well he doesn't call every night because because uh, he doesn't love them or doesn't care about them so so as an alienated parent you you can't do anything right because uh the narcissist will, will turn that around and and use it against you every time and again my greatest joy since since i was performing as a teenager was it was again to to make people laugh to to make them have fun to to make them feel special and when you can help that when you can do that it, it makes me feel good it makes me happy and you know i've mentored young people uh in various countries around the world and and they entertain so so many children you know all the time every day i try and make people smile and laugh and i can do this with again people around the world that don't even understand the words i'm saying but i can't achieve that with my own two daughters it it it, it, it breaks my heart well you know dean the beautiful thing is you being able to come on here and tell your story you know my hope is that when your daughters are earlier or older and are looking around on the internet for footage of their father they might come across this and, and hear you uh, speaking about what you've gone through in relation to what they're going through. And uh, I, I really would like to ask you right now, for that day that they find this video, what, what do you want to say to them right now? Well, you know, I try and give them a positive message of how much I, I loved, love them and I care about them. And that, you know, no matter what, I will never, ever give up my fight for them. I mean, no matter, you know, the, like I said, the lawyers that say, oh, you know, leave it alone. They're disrespecting you. Uh, you know, I, I would never, ever give up that, that, that fight for them. I mean, it becomes, uh, as anybody that's been in this, this fight, it's an expensive fight. It's a hard fight. It's a, it's an emotionally draining fight, but I'm, I mean, you know, if, if you can't fight for your children, I mean, there's nothing else fighting for. So, I mean, uh, I'll never give it up that, I, you know, I, I need this to do it. Not for me. I need to do it for them. I need, need to save them. I need to help them. So, so uh, you know, and, and hopefully one day when this is all gone and I, I always hope that day is sooner than, than later, that it's not five, 10, 15 years down the road that they will look back and, and show it. I mean, they haven't taken any presents from me for like the last three years. I got Christmas presents still wrapped and, and sitting there, but I, I refuse to get rid of them because someday they'll come back and I'll say, here's your, you know, your Christmas present for when you were eight years old. You know, I, I still care. There's cards with, you know, money in there from, from grandparents and so forth. Um, so, you know, the, hopefully one day they'll, they'll be able to go through and, and see that and, and know that people always loved them, that they always cared about them. And, you know, everybody was, was there for them. And that's the thing. You're, you're right. We never stop fighting. Unfortunately, this fight takes an emotional toll on you and over time, not being able to see your children and the longer that it drags out, we become tired and you got to learn yeah. to take a little bit of a break and be easy on yourself. One of the things that I experienced very early on, and I try to encourage people and talk to them about it that's going through it, 
after this alienation goes on for a while, you start getting this incredible self doubt. You even start taking some of that guilt and putting it on your shoulders. Where did I go wrong? Where did I go wrong? And then that alienation goes on and it just makes you not even want to get out of bed. Have you experienced any of those symptoms? Well, of, uh, of course you go through the different steps and, and you have to self evaluate and you do that. Okay. What did I do wrong? What could I, I I've done differently. And you look at every time you've seen them or, 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 or been with them. And I was like, well, how could I change that? You know, how could I convince the mother, um, you know, that, that they're okay. You know, they, the, the mother tries to put in things of, of, you know, being unsafe. And one of the things when we came up in court, for instance, was, was, Oh, well, when I, the girls went there, I, I, ch I changed the password on my Wi-Fi so that they could connect with, with the mother through the internet with through their tablets in case there was a problem. And I was like, I went to court and said, well, my Wi-Fi has been the same for you know 20 years. I've never changed it. So, I mean, you know, you, you start putting that fear in, 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 in kids and it's like, well, that's not even true. Like, you know, how, how can you do that? But again, they start putting those little cracks or, you know, tearing up pictures of, of when you were happily together in front of the kids and say, well, you know, we don't need that anymore. And, and, you know, what kind of message does that send to, to, to the children? It's, it's all these little things. And it's like, well, okay, maybe I shouldn't have sent the pictures back. You know, I thought maybe they would be saved. You know, what, what do you do? How do you change it? And, and, and like we talked about earlier, you know, having uh, patience, showing kindness, showing love, uh, lead by example. Children, you know, they, they're like mirrors. However we act, they act. So if the alienating parent is not talking to you, uh, refuses to show any kindness toward the other parent, the, the child is going to emulate that. So, you know, those brief times that you do get or that I get with my children, even though they're not talking to me, you know, you, you go through the through the you know the drive through and you're always saying please and thank you and being kind to other people and and so hopefully that they'll 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 learn and mirror from the positive behavior the problem is that it's so minute um and then they they, they go back to the the parent that that's doing the alienating and then they get the, the negative performer i'll say you know my my ex is a bad person because she does have a lot of love and kindness and and, and she's She's, she's very good with other people and, and children. And, and I know she has a lot of love there. It's just, you know, something is there that as a narcissist, you know, everything is either really good or really bad, right? right? So at one time, you know, I was really good and really loving, really perfect. And now because things didn't, didn't work out, uh, now everything is really bad and really negative. There, there, there's no good. And unfortunately, that's what my children see now. They don't see any good in me or, or the grandparents on my side of the family. Everything is just really bad and really negative. Dean, in the beginning, was it zero to 60 with the alienation or was it more or less you guys realized you were splitting up and then a lawyer got involved and might have uh, contributed to that alienation? Um, well... I don't know if the lawyers actually contributed to it, but I mean, right from the beginning, I wanted co-parenting because that's what everything shows now is that the best way to parent children is through co-parenting half the time with the father, half the time with the mother, you know, you, you don't have to like each other, but you can be cordial. You can be friendly. Uh, you can set positive examples from the children. I don't know what it is in the United States, but in Canada, when you get divorced, parents have to take a, a program called for the sake of the children. We think something similar. Yeah. Okay, so, so things that you're supposed to do and interact to set positive examples for the children, you know, not to say bad things in front of the children, so forth, but you can take the course, but that doesn't mean you have to follow it. And so if a parent doesn't follow that, you know, that leads that's the first step of parent alienation. Uh, so I had the lawyer one time in court, her lawyer say, I don't believe in co-parenting. He was an older lawyer in his seventies. I don't believe in co-parenting. So that's not going to happen. And it's like, well, it's not what you believe. It's like, this is what society says. This is what statistics show that the best raised children through a divorce or separation is through co-parenting. Right. So I, I'm, I'm just curious, um, Dean, what was contact 
with your children, like while the children were with you? Was it something that they were constantly contacting the children when they were in your possession? Uh, sorry, were they like calling on the telephone and checking up on them a lot? Uh, no, no, that, that, that okay. never really, really happened. Uh, again, I would usually have them for a short period of times initially. Again, initially everything was great. You know, the kids right. were great. We'd go to Disneyland, you know, we went to Niagara Falls on holidays. Um, you know, we had a lot of fun, positive experiences. And then I, I started to notice that things like anxiety would get on. So we'd go have a positive experience. Mm -hmm. And then it was time to take the girls home. They would start getting nervous and afraid and that because now they had to tell their mother that they had fun, that they had a good time. And, and that would cause them stress and anxiety. And I think part of it was uh, happened was that they didn't want to have to go home and be stressed to tell their mother that they had fun with their dad, you know, that they, they loved them, that it was easier just to, you know, say everything was bad and not have fun than to go home and, and, and say that things were good because, you know, the, the, the mother couldn't handle that, that they had fun. And I, and again, in hindsight, I saw this behavior with her first ex-husband and again, not knowing a parent alienation. And, you know, you think, well, you know, you have to support your wife that maybe, uh, you know, the first ex-husband, he must've been a really bad guy, right? You know, the, to have all this, uh, she was tried to alienate the kids uh, really and, and went through a lot of that behavior, but it didn't quite turn into alienation. Uh, now, years later, she had more experience and became better at it. Um, but, but like I said, hindsight's always the best sight. Absolutely. And the reason I ask a lot of times people that are being alienated when they finally get time with the children, they'll see the ex constantly contacting every five, 10, half an hour. You know, I just want to check on you, baby. Is that okay? And while that might not seem like a big deal, when somebody's constantly saying, I just want to check on you, make sure you're okay. The, there's the little overtones, just like, do I have a reason to be afraid? And th that's how these little seeds get planted along the way. So yeah. I just, I just wanted to clarify that, but what has this relationship been like with your family? Um, you know, parental alienation, they don't just alienate the, the parent. It goes on to the, the grandparents, the aunts, the uncles, the nephews, the nieces, the brothers, the sisters, the whole nine yards. What has that been like for the rest of your family? Yeah. Dean? And, and that's another hard, hard part about it. Again, again, it's the ripple effect. You take the, the pebble, you throw it in the clear pond, and then the ripples go. And, you know, as, as a father, I can fight with this. I, and when you see it happening to the grandparents, loving, caring, uh, you know, get, gifted grandparents that just want to show, show unconditional love and caring as, as grandparents do uh, for them to be alienated. And, and you know, my, my father is, is quite sick and ill and he's in, in the hospital as, as we speak. Um, you know, he, he just had a, a really bad bout of cancer and, and spent like three and a half months in the hospital uh, a year ago and recovering. And so, you know, his time on this life is, is short. You know, my, my, my mom is, is in, and her husband, they're, they're getting, uh, you know, older and, and, and losing this precious time. And that's just it. I mean, we can always make more money. We can always, you know, do this or do that, but we can't buy more time. And that's the hardest part of this. We, we lose this valuable time with our children when we're alienated and we lose it with the grandparents and they're, they're getting on a tight window. They don't have, you know, all, all this time with, well, okay, well, we can wait five years or 10 years that, you know, they'll, they'll be out of the picture. Um, you know, it, it, it's wasted. You know, how do you get that back? You know, did you go to the courts and, 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 and you know, spend, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars and finally recoup the children. I, you know, I I've lost over a thousand nights, not being able to tuck my daughters in at night. You know how, how important that is for a father to tuck their kids in at night, you kiss them on the forehead, tell them you love them, you know, know that they're safe in bed and you, you know, you're going to be there and protect them to the, through the night. You know, that that's, that's hard for grandmother or grandparent to have them not sit on their lap and tell them a story, read a storybook to them. You can't get that time back. That's why parent alienation needs to be made illegal. It has to be banned. It has to, 
be abolished. It, it, it's a horrible, horrible crime. I know it's crazy because most, uh, a lot of these organizations will tell you that parental alienation doesn't even exist. It's yeah. taboo. <laughs> it's something that's made up with us fathers and mothers because we just don't want to pay child support. You know, yeah. it's, and then it just gets swept away. And what's so bad, Dean, is our community, you know, we know what we're going through and we get out here and we fight. Yeah. Just, we have such very little support because there's too many people that are making money off of it. And the alienators, let's just be honest, they benefit and they're the majority. You know, I honestly thought when we started this podcast, I figured parental alienation was just one of those things that was kind of rare. It did happen, but it was a little bit here, a little bit there. Parental alienation is running more rampant than I could have ever imagined. It's in a majority of the cases. And I would say a lot of this could be avoided by effective co-parenting and getting the courts. You know, like you was talking about that course that you took. Um, after you got divorced, we have something similar here in Georgia where they tell you what to say to the ex and what not to. What if they made you take that together? What if we learned how to co-parent and, and to work it together instead of it? As soon as we find out we don't want to be together anymore, we're going to go straight to family court where we get to sling mud at each other. And then that, that already shows them your relationship outside of your marriage is throwing stuff back and forth at each other and you never get anything done. You know, I do believe if we, we, we rolled it on back two people that came together to make a kid, let's come together and let's parent that child. Is that something that you would like to see? Like, I, I would love to sit down with you. I would love to work this thing out. Let's, let's go back to the beginning when me and you, you know, used to see eye to eye, let's wipe out everything. I just want a relationship with my child and I don't mind communicating with you. Let's just get this thing the way it needs to be. Yeah. And, and you know what? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. That that's the way it should be. But for, to do that, you need two healthy individuals, right? And unfortunately not everybody is healthy right. physically, mentally that can do that. And, and when you get divorced, you go through, you know, the, the different five stages of grieving, just as somebody died because your relationship dies. So, you know, you're not at those, those, those points at different times. Some people, and I think as an alienator, they don't go through that whole grieving process. They, they keep that hate there. And, you know, I don't hate my ex-wife. I, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll always care about her as the mother of my children. But, you know, I, I'm so past that point. It's like, you know, can't we just get along for the sake of the children? You know, that's what it's about, for the sake of the children. You know, this, this is just crazy, crazy. It, it is, man. And unfortunately, when you get this high conflict stuff going on and the, the family courts get a hold of it, it's, it's what we get. That's, that's why we talk about equal shared parenting a lot here. I believe, you know, after divorce, if we both had 50-50, we didn't have to go fight each other. You would see a yeah. lot of this mess just completely go away. Have you yeah. seen the marriage story on Netflix yet, Dean? The marriage story? No, I'm sorry, I haven't. Oh, uh, you need to check that out. It's oh. it, it's it's a movie that just came out. There's two parents. They're starting to grow apart, but they're still oh. so very friendly with each other. They could have effectively co-parented, and they were, even though they would get a little angry with each other at times because they was breaking apart. But they they seemed like they could just do it. By the time they visited the lawyers, oh. and they start feeding it in their head, oh no, wait, he's gonna start slinging mud. She's gonna start slinging mud. You need to do this. You need to do this. And then you get to see what it was. That was such an accurate depiction of what we've got going on and how we end up clashing. You know what? And I started watching that and I got about a third of the way through and I had to stop. It was too painful to watch. Yep. You know, I, I, I know the movie you're talking about now. Yeah. It just became too painful. Where again, the, they, they started in such a healthy way and then the lawyers destroyed it. And, you know, that's how I started. I told my ex, we'll, you know, we'll use the same lawyer. We'll, you know, I'll pay for everything. We'll get divorced. And it's like, boom, no, she goes to her lawyer uh, who happened to be my ex lawyer. And then I get, and then it's like, boom, boom, you know, and it's like, well, you know, what do you want? I just want what I'm entitled to and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, it, they, they create conflict. As soon as you get divorced, it's, it's the parents' names against each other. You know, Smith versus Smith, Kramer versus Kramer. It should not be two people versus each other because there is exactly. no win. You can't win. People only lose 
the only ones that win is the lawyers because they make all the money. So I think we need to change that title right from the begin, beginning. And it's, it's not, it shouldn't be me versus you. What if it was Smith with Smith or Kramer with Kramer? Because, yes. you know, whether you are getting out of a loving relationship together, you two are always going to have somewhat, of, you're going to have that co-parenting relationship. And we've got to learn to nurture these co-parenting relationships. And again, guys, we know there is times that's just not going to happen. But I believe the court should make it a point before child support and all this other bull crap goes down, let's get these two people in the room and make sure that we could get them effectively uh, co-parenting and communicating. If not, let's start using these parenting apps. I want to tell you these parenting apps that's been coming out over the past few years. I'm a big fan of that. I really think that should be uh, one of the main forms of communication used. If, if parents can't communicate with each other, let's get them on this parenting app and get them communicating and make them work it out. And uh, I think you would see a lot different results. Unfortunately, that's not what we got. It's just not what we got, my man. Well, the system that we have is definitely broken. It needs it needs change. We have government funding that that you know it's easier to spend money on on faraway wars and stuff than it is to try and fix a, a, a family. Uh, so it's man. just you know you to 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 have change, people have to want change. And the lawyers aren't going to change it. They, they, there's, there's too much money involved. Right. And you know, you know what? So that I don't process... know. How, how, how do we change that process? You know, yeah. again, uh, uh, as a skeptic, as a magician, as a skateboarder, you try and figure out solutions. That's what I've done all my life. I've tried to figure out solutions, how to, how to fix things, how, you know, the, the weakness of strength. And, and I tell you right now, I, I don't know. I don't know what the solution is, but that's why we all need to put our heads together, all our brain trust, and find a solution. Well, you know, that's easier said than done, man. We've got a lot of doctors that are working on this behind the scene, but it's getting everybody to unite and make, you know, one of the biggest things that we, we go against with at the podcast here, and I know Chris can back me up on this. Uh, I think we're doing really good things with the podcast, but everybody wants you to come, wants to come tell you their story. And everybody you talk to has this story that you've never heard of before and how it's different than everybody else is a man. You just got to hear this. It's, it's, it's going to fix everything that we're going through. Once people find out what I'm going through, you finally break down. It's like, okay, what is your story? It's just like everybody else's. It's like finding out mm -hmm. it's about all of us coming together rather than an individual effort. Uh, you might have differences with the person sitting across from you every once in a while. And that's okay. That's when you talk it and you learn how to communicate and get along. And that's, that's how we learn. You know, I don't, I don't want to sit across from somebody that uh, just tells me the same thing, or yeah, I want to sit beside somebody that's got a different opinion. And that's, that's what challenges me to question things. And it's much like the relationship with the other side. You learn to work with each other, and that's the answer. That's solutions. We got to learn to work with each other and come together and do this thing together. And so far, man, it's 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 been a rough battle, but we're seeing some real progress. We really are, and uh, I am so glad that you found this podcast, my man, because uh, and and to hear that it's been useful to you, and you know you've learned stuff from it. That that goes a long way because that's what we're trying to do here. More people need to be educated. And yeah. they need to know about this before they're going through it. Like yeah, you. exactly. It's it, like, like you said, you need that course. It's, you got to have positive communication and you have to have awareness. And so as long as you keep creating awareness for, for everybody out there, I've got your back, brother, 100%. Yes, sir. You got any more questions, Chris, or I'm about to go in, in a different direction with this, my man? Oh, I'm good. Go ahead. Okay. So. I thank you for talking about all of this, Dean, but I would kick myself in the butt if I didn't ask you a few questions right now. I got a fan out, okay? So tell me about your relationship with Randy and how you got involved with the amazing Randy. Well, you know, I first I first met the amazing Randy. Again, I, I, I remember watching him on Happy Days and his his work on The Tonight Show. And, and you know, he was the greatest skateboarder since Houdini. And... Uh, when I was a, a young escape artist, you know, I started hanging from buildings while my ankles getting out of a straight track when I was 18 years old or getting nailed in coffins and thrown in rivers when I was 19 and, you know, doing all this stuff. Like, this is what I, 
I wanted to do. And, and sometimes I, I succeeded and sometimes I, I failed. I mean, there's, there's one YouTube clip uh, back from Halloween of 1983 where I got chained in a coffin, uh, locked up, thrown into an icy river in Canada. And, uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't escape. I was underwater for like four minutes. I was blue, turned blue and conscious in debt and I died. You know, I saw the lights at the end of the tunnel and the ambulance crew that were there. We had over 10,000 people to cheer me on. I, they had to you know, put me in the ambulance, rush me away, bring me back to life. And so, you know, sometimes you, you, you learn by learning and sometimes you learn by failing. And so I had all these different scrapbooks and Randy was, was given a, a lecture at a university near Minneapolis, Minnesota. And I took my scrapbooks, my press clippings and that, and, you know, I, I, I had to borrow some money to get down to see him. I go listen to his lecture. You know, Randy's the smartest person I, I've ever met. He's, he's, he's a genius. He, he knows everything about a anything. And, uh, you know, afterwards I talked to him and I showed him my scrapbooks and deed. And I spent a couple of days, you know, uh, with him and uh, he understood what I was saying. He, 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 he liked my uh, attitude of escapism, my, my professionalism, uh, the things I was able to accomplish and, and my dreams and my goals that I had as, as a young person. And so uh, he believed me enough to get me on that first TV special back in Halloween of 1987, where they did like a live uh, two hour special. On, on Houdini with the milk cannon. William Shatner was the host. I saw that. It, David Copperfield, Penn and Teller, Harry Blackstone Jr., uh, you know, all these great acts from Vegas. And then there was me, this kid from Canada that nobody had ever heard about. You look like a little bit of a rock star back then, my man. <laughs> I saw the hair and he was rocking the abs coming oh, out. Yeah, it was yeah. definitely the 80s. That, that was a good that time, a, huh? Yeah, yeah, that was that was my my Bon Jovi phase. Yeah, I always <laughs> had, you know, leather jackets and rhinestones and spandex and all yeah, that, right. that fun stuff of the 80s. And anyway, we, you know, so I got, got to perform and I escaped from some handcuffs that nobody had ever escaped from since Houdini. And then, of course, Randy got hurt and I had to step in and fill for, the, for him. So Randy has always been a, a positive role model and a, and a mentor. And, and like I said, his, his undying work with uh, in the skepticism movement and, and standing up for people's rights has always been there. And he's written so many different books on exposing faith healers. Uh, his book, Flim Flam, where he talks about the Bermuda Triangle and, and UFOs and things, uh, I, I think should be in every school. You know, kids, uh, adults need to learn about the truth. And, and, and so people don't get the wool pulled over their eyes and they don't get con. Um, so, yeah, he, he was good. He, he's 91 now. I was down for his 90th birthday uh, a year ago in August. And he was, he's still... Oh, still man. got some fight in him. He's still got some spunk and he's, you know, he's, 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 he's not ready to surrender. So, you know, I, I've always appreciated him uh, mentoring me as, as a young person and believing in me. And, you know, that, that's all I could wish for any young children, my children, any children out there is, is, is to, to have a dream, to have a goal. You, you, nothing comes without hard work and dedication and, that's right. and uh, you know, having, having that, that passion. Uh, and then good things can, can come. But yeah, Randy was a dear, dear man. And if there's ever a chance, man, and y'all are in the area and he's by, please let me know. I'd, I'd love to meet <laughs> him. But I just want to give everybody a little quick story about that and why I bring that up. I do believe we need some people like Randy inside of this movement right here. Um, one thing he did back in the day, guys, there, there was this faith healer. His name was Peter Popoff. And he would take these prayer requests when you would come to his meeting. And if you had like cancer or whatever, and it would put, they would put down their address and the whole nine yards and he would wear a little in ear monitor and somebody would be feeding him that information. And he'd pull him out of the crowd and say, God told me your name, what you're going through and, and you're going to be healed. And uh, these people just thought this man was, you know, just completely anointed by God. And Randy's the one that found out by doing his, you know, science that this guy was being fed this and he, he completely debunked that and inevitably shut that service down. But, you know, I think Brandy, he wanted magic to be real. If somebody could actually prove to him, he was going to offer them a big sum of money 
but he stood up for what he thought was right because a lot of these people tried to use this to get over on people that really wanted something good. So he stood up for what was right, and he got a lot of hate for that. A lot of hate. He got a lot of hate for that. And we're going to need some Randys inside this movement because I'm going to tell you, Dean, what we're standing up for, we know it's right. And we know we're doing this for the children and we're doing it for our children's children. And it's going to get us a lot of hate and it can be a little bit scary sometimes. Look what happened with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King stood up for what was right and what happened to him in the end. So anytime you stand up for something that's right, it might come with a little bit of opposition. But we need some people that aren't afraid to say, you know what, we're going to take this thing to task. And that's exactly what we got to do with parental alienation. I believe it's one of the number one things uh, that needs to be addressed on the face of this earth, man. It's it's not just a United States, States issue. We're talking to Dean. He's in Canada. I've talked to people in Africa, Australia, England, Canada. I mean, I just said Canada, but it's a yeah. worldwide issue. And we we need to get some leaders that say, you know what? We know it's a big task, but we're not scared. And I, I just kind of wanted to make that correlation with your mentor right there, man, because I, I mean, it, it definitely is something I can see that we need. We definitely yeah. need it. Yeah, we, we, we you know, we, we need fighters. We need, you know, people to, to, to come forward and, 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 you know, share the stories. And you're giving people a great opportunity to do that. And, and like I said, create that awareness, create that communication. Uh, and like I said, the, the biggest problem that I, f I find is that when you talk about parent alienation, and, and like we said at the beginning of the show, as soon as you, you talk about it, the first thing comes up is like, w what did you do? You know, what, what's, what's wrong with you? What's, why don't they want to see their grandparents? I was like, you know, they must be mean. Like, what's going on? They don't understand the concept of, 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 of the alienator and, and, and the, the things that they inflict on the, on the children uh, to become that way. Well, Dean, I want to say the alienator is much like Peter Popoff and what they was doing. You go, he, the people was going in there telling them their name, their address, what was wrong with them. And he knew what to say to them. Yeah. That's exactly what happens to us with our alienator. Mm -hmm. We tell them the intimate details of our life. They know what makes us tick. They know what makes us angry. And they know we've told them personal experiences. We've already fed them the information to yeah. use back at us. Okay. Yeah. And that's what they use to gaslight us. And then when we get really angry, see, I told you that's how yeah. they act. Yeah. That's they exactly know how to what push happens. The and then they teach the children how to push those buttons. That's you know, right. Like I said, they, they know our ins and outs. You like, you know, you share things with them that, like I said, because you know, you love them, you care about, and then they turn and use that information against you. That's and, right. Uh, you know, and then they tell other people, then other people use that information against you. They're like, what? And then, you know, how things get mis, you know, uh, diluted and changed. And it's like, you know, the, it's like, it's like, what are you talking about? You know? Watch what you're putting down on your prayer request, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know, when Randy did that with Peter Popov, I, re I remember that, that well. And, you know, this was, you know, the cell phones weren't around back then, you know, in, in, in the mid 80s when that happened. And, uh, you know, Randy had to really use a lot of hard work to figure that out, what was going on. And, and Peter Popov was using cutting edge technology, you know, with his wife sitting there in the background talking about it. So, the way he went about it is he went on his the the Johnny Carson show, uh, the Tonight Show. Who, who Johnny Carson was a big believer in Randy, and Randy been on there over over thirty times over his career, and and showed the footage. So he shows the footage of what's happening at first, and you look at that and go, "Oh my goodness, he's got a direct link to God Himself, and and God has given him these these this information, and then he's making people you know walk and." Things and then you listen to it again, where Randy had used uh, some some special technology he got from him to intercept these messages, and you hear his wife talking in the background. Hey, Peter, how's it going? I hope you can hear me, or otherwise you're going to be in trouble. And you know, go look on row 36, and there's a gentleman there with that has cataracts, and you know, it's like how would they know this information and do it? And, and so Randy put him out of business. Now, unfortunately, now he's come back around and you do see him on late night, night television again, Peter Popov selling holy water. I saw that. Miracle yeah. water. Miracle water, right out of the tap. <laughs> and you know what? The, the sad part about it is 
it's working. It might not get everybody, but it's getting enough to do what he needs it to do. Mm -hmm. And that's because people are desperate for change and they'll do anything. And it's the same as what's going on inside of this community. There's definitely many healers and uh, different people out there that are saying, come here and we're going to get you changed. And there are people, they don't even want it to change. You want to know why they make too much money off of it. Watch who you're getting your information from and watch who you're giving information to because it can and will be used against you. And uh, it's a sick, sick game that we're up against, man. You got to be on your toes and be mindful all the time. So those those definitely correlate those stories, man. And uh, I, I, I never thought I'd have the opportunity to talk to somebody about it, especially like you. So uh, you know what, Dean? You've learned to escape many things from straight jackets uh, to, to graves. Help us learn how to escape from parental alienation, man. That would be the greatest escape that we could do you know that's what we got to find out and how to do it together and that's one stunt i will help you perform i'll do it with you yeah well you know like we all need to help each other we all need to you know stand together we need to you know educate we need to give positive messages uh, out out to the public you know we've got to work we ain't going to change the judges and lawyers so we have to get the media and and, and get them involved and and spreading the message Uh, we need to do it now we have social media and i think what you're doing with your new tv show and the podcast that's going to make positive change and 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 i've told you this earlier and i'll tell you again any way i can help with this you 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 know i'm there and i look forward to the day when parent alienation is is gone that on the books is 50 50 co-parenting and this will just be something that that they'll talk about in future generations of when this happened, uh, such as as you know when I did a, a a TV show in in West Virginia at a lunatic asylum where they locked me up in this this uh, asylum for the mentally insane, and I had to escape. And you know, back over a hundred years ago, husbands could take and just drop their wives off at the at the asylum. And instead of getting divorced, you know what? I want to want this woman. She's got some problems, drop off and drive away and leave her there. Right. That was cruel, unusual punishment. You know, in the in the 50s, 60s, men could get divorced and, and not have to give their wives anything and left them destitute. So, you know, we've had positive changes in the evolution of, of, of divorce. Now the next change is co-parenting. Sooner or later, as it's starting to happen in other countries, the past laws, Australia, Brazil, Mexico, someday this, this law will be passed in the United States and Canada and Europe. Without a doubt, it will be passed because it is a crime. But we need to make it happen sooner rather than later. Right, because there's nothing that we can do to completely eradicate parental alienation. Again, it's a mental instability, and that they're using that. So we're we're not going to be able to get rid of that per se. That's like saying that we're going to get rid of HIV or something like that, you know. But at the same time, if we have laws protecting against it, and it's recognized at least when it goes to family court or when it's being used, we can say this is what they're doing. Do something about it. Yeah, they and need to recognize take, it. Take the children out of a harmful situation and give them to the non alienating parent. Yes, sir. You know, well, Dean, it, I tell you it what, it has to man, be for the kids. We've had you for a little over an hour, and I know your time is precious. And I know you're down there in Texas, man. Please go get some brisket and let me know how it tastes. <laughs> I haven't had the pleasure of being to Texas yet. And that's the main reason I want to go. I'm not going to lie. Um, I'm a foodie. I always bring up food on the podcast, but, uh, let us know how that tastes if you will. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I, I've been here for the last couple of days and, you know, the the Mexican food, the brisket, it's just like, it's phenomenal. I, I, every time I come here, I, 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 you know, I gain a couple extra pounds and, you know, I don't know if I get out of a wet paper bag right now because, you know, I've, I've eaten so much in the last two days, but, you know, I'll go back to Canada and whip back into the shape quick and, and stuff. But, oh yeah, yeah, it's good, good, good food. Yeah, I'd be careful with question. getting... Oh, I kind of have a that. fun question for you. So out of all yeah. the places you've traveled to where you've done stunts and been on TV, is there one place in Canada or the United States that when you go in, when you go there, you know, I'm going to that restaurant, like a favorite? Ooh, well, you know, uh, with my TV show, Escape or Die, every episode where I'm getting changed to a roller coaster, 
are, you know, tied to a Viking ship in Iceland and blown up. After every episode, we always go out and eat and talk about what happened. And we go to a local restaurant or, or, and, and talk about it. Because when I perform, I won't eat. I won't eat for the whole day because I don't like to go on stomach with, you know, being full or bloated or anything like that. You won't eat. So after the show, my crew knows we go out and we eat. And that's part of the experience uh, as a performer and as an individual. So I, I like to go try good food. And, you know, I, I don't want to throw out any plugs here, but but I, I'm, I'm here in between San Antonio and Austin right now. And I have my, my family, my, my cousin Roland, to have a great little place in San Marcos called Ivers River Pub. And they serve really good barbecue. And I don't know, they're getting my face on the wall from eating there too much. But I mean, you know, it's, a, it's, it, it's good, good food. But, you know, uh, I'll be back there again on, on Sunday to watch the Super Bowl. Uh, before I head back to Canada, but but uh, you know I, I I do love to travel. I I love I love Colombia, in in South America they have you know great food. Um, I know there's a lot going on in China right now, but I, I I've been performing in China for over 30 years, and I I love the Chinese food. It's it's not like North American Chinese food. I mean it's right. it's real food. I'm I'm not so much into the chicken heads or the chicken feet or the pig brain but i mean they they make some really really good you know chinese food. You, you know what they call food or, or chinese food in china what's that food <laughs> it's not a gimmick <laughs> it's not chinese food in china it's just food <laughs> yeah so i mean you kind of answered one of my questions but would you say you highly advise not to eat mexican food before getting into a casket and being yeah, buried alive absolutely <laughs> absolutely so i appreciate you delaying the the broadcast a little early because i got locked in the washroom i couldn't get out earlier oh, you know so. <laughs> oh, wow. i got you my man well dean we've had you for a little over an hour and i want to say thank you so much my man for coming to uh dad talk and we we, we, you know, our thoughts and our hearts are out there with you, man. I, I just, as, as is with everybody, we hope that one day we can find some solutions. That's what we're working for here. So to have you on, it was a, it was an honor. Yes, well, you. I truly appreciate you letting me come on and, 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 you know, tell, tell them my, my experience and my, and my story. Uh, you guys are doing a great job. Keep, you know, keep it up and never surrender, ne never give up. Um, and that's, you know, if I can tell that message to to the other uh, parents that are going through parent alienation, you know, be patient, you know, keep showing lots of love, you know, just, just let that magic, magic happen. And, and, uh, you know, hopefully one day this will all be in the, in, in the distant past and, and, you know, all our children will come back to us. So, you know, I can't, I can't tuck my daughters in, into bed tonight again, but, uh, you know, hopefully somewhere they, they know that I love them and I care about them and, just like each and every other parent that that's going through it. That's all right, brother. Well, guys, thank you again, Dean. And tonight we were sponsored by the Isaac Law Firm, Upstream Growth Consultants, the Father's Rights Movement, and the House Champ, Mr. Yaya McLean, two-time world champion, has became the newest real estate agent in the Atlanta, Georgia market. Thank you to all of our sponsors. Thank you, Chris and Dean. Again, thank you, my man. Thank you, Dean. Thank you. All right, United guys. we stand. Divided we fall. And let's find <laughs> out that escape, the greatest yeah. escape. Let's escape. And you know what? Uh, hopefully next time, you know, you can come come see me at a show. We'll all have fun. Perinade Nation will have disappeared. And hopefully we can just, uh, you know, do some magic, make some escape and happen. And, and you know. Eat some barbecue. Your, eat some barbecue. <laughs> yeah. You know, we got lots of good stuff on YouTube or, or Facebook. And, you know, lot, lots That's of. That's right. Dean, stuff. where can everybody find you, my man? Well, the, again, there's lots of stuff on, on YouTube, lots of uh, good escapes, a lot of bad escapes, dying, you know, getting hit by roller coasters. Uh, but there's some, some good stuff there. And, of course, Facebook, Twitter, all that kind of kind of stuff. You know, I don't I don't uh, talk about my parent alienation so much on, on those th those forms. And, and, you know, so that that doesn't upset the, the court system or, or anything like that. And, and uh, but. You know, if you, if you watch me, see me escape and know that somewhere in my heart that there's a fight there for parent alienation. That's right. All right, brother. Well, everybody have a good night and thank you for joining us at Dad Talk today. We kick off another episode at eight o'clock tomorrow. 
be there, stay cool, stay dead, and we'll catch you later on down the road. Thank you all.